will you join your hearts with mine in prayer? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please stand with me. Before his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, before his betrayal and arrest, Jesus told his disciples to meet him on a mountain in Galilee after his resurrection. After his death, the disciples are told by the women who went to the tomb that it was empty and that they saw the resurrected Lord. So the disciples went to meet Jesus on that mountain in Galilee. It's the mountain where they received the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all nations. It's what we're about to read together. It's also the mountain of the transfiguration. It's the same mountain where Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. It is a place apart like this one, where the Lord can be alone with his disciples, to be present with them, to teach them, to encourage them. So in the presence of our Lord, join me as we read together. God's word. <coughs> now, the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. What is in a name? How important, really, is a name? Next Saturday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., the Daughter Church will have a booth at the Okra Strut in Irmo. The Okra Strut is the largest annual festival in Irmo. Admission is free. This is their 45th year. There's a parade at 9 a.m. that should end by 10, and then there will be arts and crafts, rides, amusements, food and drink, and I would think fried okra. Well, there better be fried okra. I'm looking forward to it. Members of the Daughter Church team will be at the Okra Strut to tell everyone there that a new church is coming to Dutch Fork. To ask, what kind of church would they like to see? Something more contemporary or something more traditional? And maybe most important of all, we're going to ask people to help us name the new church. We will have some options to choose from. Should we name the new church just Dutch Fork Presbyterian Church? What about Broad River Presbyterian or something else? Of course, we won't just tally the votes and say, the people have spoken, we have a name. What we want to do is to gauge how people react to different names. Good associations with this one, bad associations with that one. Help us hear how you hear these different names. By the way, if there's a name that you think should be on that list, talk to me after worship. If we end up using your name, you're going to have eternal bragging rights. <laughs> we want to do this exercise at Okra Strut because everyone knows how important a name is. Just think of your first name. Mine, James, means successor. Sounds kind of cool, although I'm still trying to figure out how that applies to my life. Our names can have special meanings. We call our son Jack, but his proper name is John. John means God has shown us favor. God is gracious. We prayed for Jack, for John to join us for a long time. And so his name means a lot to us. If you're a Sarah, 
If your name is Sarah, your name apparently means this, happy, pure princess. If your husband is giggling, you have my permission to elbow him in the ribs. <laughs> you might have a unique name, a name nobody else has, or a family name that's been passed on to you. Whatever your name is, I can tell you that your parents thought and prayed about what to name you, and when they decided on the name, they looked at each other and said, yes, that's just right. It was the first thing they said to you after your birth, well, hello, Lena. Welcome to the big, wide world. Tara and I, my wife and I, have named two children, and I can say that there are a few things more sacred, more amazing than choosing a name and calling your child by name for the first time. The best way to describe it is that it is a blessing. God is involved. A name can be a blessing. It can also come with responsibility. In fact, it should come with responsibility. This is especially true of your family name. Let me give you an example. When I was 15, I went to see a movie with my dad called Quiz Show. It's directed by Robert Redford. It told the true story of the 21 Quiz Show scandal that happened in the 1950s. 21 was like the jeopardy of its time. Two contestants would square off and answer very difficult trivia questions. Charles Van Doren, Charlie, the son of a famous professor at Columbia University, appeared on 21 and defeated the reigning champ, Herb Stemple. Turns out that Stemple was told to take a fall by the producers of 21 to let Charlie win because Charlie was more telegenic. He just looked better on TV. Charlie, for a time, was able to win without any help or coaching, but life soon got in the way. He got busier, and he agreed to take the answers from the producers ahead of time. He became a national celebrity. The show was a wild success, but eventually the truth came out. People discovered the lie. The grand jury was convened, and the scandal became national news. The scene from the movie that I want to focus on is a conversation between Charlie and his father after it became clear that Charlie was cheating. His dad says to him, I'm sorry, Charlie, I'm an old man. It's all a little difficult for me to comprehend how you could do this. It's television, Dad. It's just television. Will you make it sound like you had no choice? What was I supposed to do at that point? Disillusion the whole country? Tell them that I was lying? Charlie, you took the money. Yes, Dad, I took the money. It was just a quiz show, Charlie. But it was mine, Dad. At that point, the father stands up and says to his son, your name is mine. I remember the car ride home with my father. <laughs> It was quiet. We were both deep in thought. And my dad turned to me and said, that's an important lesson, James. Never forget, your name is my name. To have a name, to carry a name, it's a blessing and a responsibility. Israel, the people of the Old Testament, knew this. They knew from the beginning of their covenant with God that they had been called to carry to bear God's name throughout the earth. We see the blessing, but also the responsibility of carrying that name, especially in the preaching of the prophets. According to the prophets, Israel belongs to God like I belong to the QB family. I'm part of the QB people. In Israel's case, the family name is God. It doesn't get bigger than that. And so when Israel was disobedient, it wasn't just that they'd done the wrong thing. No, they'd hurt the family name. God's reputation had been tarnished. In Jesus Christ, the covenant God made with Israel is now opened to all the nations. We can become part of the family of God. And our charge is to go to the nations and make disciples among them. And when we hear the word nations, 
you might think Jesus is speaking about the many different countries that make up the world, countries in Asia, Africa, the Middle East. What he's really speaking about is the mission to bring people who are not Jews into the covenant. For the Bible, there are really only two groups of people, Jews and Gentiles. The people of Israel, Jews, and everybody who is not a member of Israel, the Gentiles. Those are the people who belong to the nations. The covenant used to just be for Jews, but now it is also for Gentiles, for everybody else. So the nations that Jesus is speaking about in the Great Commission, go make disciples of all nations, is about the Gentiles. It's about the rest of the world. Now, how is that relevant to us? How is that relevant to the work of planting a new church in Dutch Fork? Our call is to bear God's name faithfully so that we can make disciples, so that God can make disciples through us in Dutch Fork. Put another way, the name that we will give the new church, it's crucial. It's so important. If you started a new business, you know this. But this is essential, that we honor God's name in the work of planting a new church, that we act like we belong to God's family so God can invite people to join our family through us. We must not just come up with a relevant, faithful, even cool name for the new church. We must be the kind of people God can use to do something new. We must become the people who can bear his name faithfully in Dutch Fork. Like the first disciples, we are called to carry God's name into Dutch Fork and to find there people who do not believe, people who belong to the nations, people who are not members of God's covenant yet, and invite them to join God's people, the people redeemed by Jesus Christ on the cross. If we are faithful and God blesses our work, then people will be baptized in God's name, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And we will get to be present at the spiritual birthdays of new brothers and sisters. We will get to welcome new members into our family. How do we get there? How does that happen? I'm in the middle of putting a team together of people who will begin the work of planting this new church. And we continue to need laborers for this harvest, people who will join us to do the work of starting a new community of disciples in Dutch Fork. You've been praying for this. Please continue. Continue to pray. Pray if you want at 10.02 a.m. or p.m. that God will continue to give us workers for this team. 10.02, because Jesus' command to pray for laborers for the harvest is found in Luke chapter 10, verse 2. God is faithful and has begun to send us some members of Lake Murray Presbyterian. Do you? Do you want to be part of this? If I were you, I would want to know what it would look like to join in, to be part of this. The Daughter Church team is really looking for two kinds of people, pioneers, and settlers. Pioneers are people who want to come along to help start the new church, but they might not settle there. Pioneer would work as part of the daughter church team for two to three years, help it get up and running, but might ultimately remain a member of Lake Murray Presbyterian Church. A pioneer might help start a life group, a small group that meets in homes for fellowship, for study. She might help run a vacation Bible school. She might help start a youth group at Dutch Fork Middle or Dutch Fork High. A pioneer might help with door knocking, service projects, or connect us with people in Dutch Fork that I, you see, I'm not even a two-month-old, I'm a baby Dutch Forkian, okay, that I don't have access to. So pioneer, a settler, Settler is someone who will pioneer and then will become a member of the new church. A settler might be someone who already lives east of I-26 in Dutch Fork, 
or it might be someone who begins to sense God's call today and during the work of pioneering to go with us and to become part of this new church. Is God calling you? Is God calling you to one of these roles, to pioneer, to settle? Come talk to me if you want to pray, if you want to discern together. When the disciples met on that mountain in Galilee, some worshiped and some doubted. What we are about to do in Dutch Fork is joyfully labor intensive. It will be difficult. We know the steps we need to take. We know the benchmarks we need to reach. But we don't know exactly how it will all happen, not in detail. And that would cause, I think, any of us to doubt. But don't do it. Don't doubt. Here's why. A little over a week ago, on her 10th birthday, a young woman named Ivy opened a large birthday present. But inside, she found only a piece of paper. A piece of paper. What she didn't know was that that piece of paper would change her life. Ivy spent the last three years in foster care. And the piece of paper in the birthday box said she would now be adopted by Paige and Daniel, her new parents. And more, Paige and Daniel would adopt Ivy's brothers and sisters too. It's on YouTube. Go check it out when you get home. You'll see the tears. You'll see the joy. But what's it like to be without a father or a mother? To wonder for years if you might someday have a family that you can be a part of, or if you're just going to have to make it on your own. To have no parents, to have no family. Spiritually, it's not that different from having no God. Before we knew God, before we belonged to him, we were all, like Ivy, alone, worried, wondering, is this all there is? Is it, at the end of the day, true that I'm just going to have to fend for myself? But if you belong to God, if you're a member of his family, then you know the joy Ivy knew when she found out she would be adopted. If you know that joy, the deep reassurance of being part of a family of faith, then you want other people to know it too. You want to see every spiritual foster child adopted. You want them in a loving home as soon as possible, with you, gathered around your family table. So don't doubt. Believe. Pray for. Pioneer with. Settle with us in Dutch Fork so that you can be present for that. Our story of adoption by Jesus Christ should become their story of adoption. Our family name will be their family name. And this miracle, this birthday celebration, will happen in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.